Hi, and welcome to East West Center Insights. Aloha, I'm Karina Lyons, Vice President and Director of Research at the East West Center. The Center is a cutting edge research and capacity building institution. We're based here in Hawaii and forging deeper understanding and connections between the East and the West. So every two weeks on this show, which is at Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Hawaii time, I had to think about that for a moment, it is Tuesday, um, I'll be having a conversation with an East West Center expert uh, somewhere within our global network about the biggest challenges facing our society today and into the future. And today, I'm super excited to introduce Dr. Victoria Keener. She's a research fellow with the East West Center and she's here to talk to us about the coronavirus and climate change. So Dr. Kina is a specialist in hydroclimatology, oh gosh, I practiced this beforehand. She's a specialist in hydroclimatological research. I'd like to see that on your business card. And she directs our federally funded Pacific Research and Integrated Sciences Assessment or the Pacific RESA program. And that focuses on climate related impacts, adaptation and mitigation policies in the Pacific Islands. Dr. Victoria Kena, welcome. Hi, thank you, Karina. Hi, um, welcome to the coronaverse. It's so bizarre, for those of you who don't know, uh, Victoria and I live 11 minutes walk away from each other, but uh, we're trying to lead by example by talking to each other in our respective um, living rooms. I, I, see you did, I see you cleaned up a little. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so let's, uh, let's chat about the, um, the coronaverse that we're currently in. So this global pandemic or lockdown has been um, called a temporary breather for the planet. And uh, that's because far less carbon is being burned, right? Because we're flying less and we're doing less in terms of commercial activities. Mm -hmm. And the government response has been dramatic. Um, many of the things that have been done kind of look like what needs to be done to mitigate the impacts of climate change. So what do you think we can learn about how to address the climate crisis by watching the COVID-19 pandemic response and how it's unfolded? Yeah, it's a great question because while not wanting to minimize the impact of the pandemic or um, any of the public health issues, there really are a lot of parallels between it and the climate crisis um, and kind of how, the, um, how it has evolved over decades really. Um, so that it's kind of a, a different temporal scale. We've seen in a matter of months um, what the climate crisis and community has been going through for decades. Um, so there was a lack of coordinated response until this kind of disaster scale threshold was reached for the virus. Um, so the virus was spreading kind of underground um, until it started community spread in several cities and then hospitals were under threat of being overwhelmed. That's kind of analogous to temperatures rising steadily around the world all of this time over the last century until suddenly we're seeing it detectable more and more that fingerprint in extreme rainfall, uh, wildfires and coral bleaching around the world. Mm. So really it's like a microcosm of that problem, right? So we went from denying that the, uh, that the virus was a problem in January to right. admitting, admitting it was there, but blaming it on something else in February to saying the solutions were just too expensive in March. And then finally saying uh, we were willing to die and condemn others to death instead of just solving the problem by modifying our behavior. So this is really decades of the climate change debate in just three months. Right, but for so many um, regular people, um, climate change is so abstract. So when we look at these analogies, we think, okay, that kind of makes sense, but would the impact of climate change be as extreme as what we're experiencing now in terms of the, the, um, the global, pand global pandemic, this crisis? Well, the threat, um, so the threat from climate change to people's future livelihoods and their children's lives and livelihoods are just as severe or more severe than those from the coronavirus. Um, but humans are very bad at planning for the future, right? We're much better at reacting in the moment, um, cobbling together a solution or accepting and adapting to whatever our new normal is. Um, but really, this is a chance for us for the sake of a more healthy, equitable, and ecologically functional future um, to come together and make sure that this is not just another disaster that we accept and um, adapt to, really. Right. But uh, just to keep uh, digging down and to try to make it real for people, I mean, do you think adapting to climate change, will it be as devastating for our economy as it has been dealing with the coronavirus? 
Yeah, so that's a very interesting question um, because we have seen these massive economic impacts, right? And so people are saying, you know, if this is what adapting to climate change looks like, then how are we going to do this in a way where um, our systems, our communities, our businesses, um, our governments are able to keep on functioning um, and we're able to live our lives. Um, so what we've seen in the pandemic is that the crisis has triggered massive and mostly voluntary behavioral change on a scale that has been considered impossible um, to do for climate change impacts in, in uh, the day before any of this happened, um, right. not just in the United States, but across the world. And a lot of times that impossibility was really linked to the economy and market-based, uh, looking through a market-based lens. So for example, um, some of the analysis done on um, looking at different climate change adaptations and mitigations, uh, there have been different financial institutions that have said, because there is a 1% drop projected in global GDP that would come out of these, uh, come out of these adaptations, um, it's not worth doing. And um, now what we see is there's been way more than a 1% drop, um, and we're going to be recovering from this uh, for um, years, probably. So in this crisis, we've really seen what happens when we react instead of plan ahead. Um, so in this case, the economic impacts are far more dire and faster um, than any of the adaptations that um, are being proposed for uh, mitigating climate change and adapting to the impacts of climate change. So for example, um, in looking at green infrastructure and green jobs and, and um, instituting um, different energy systems, um, those are much more carefully planned transitions in energy and um, agricultural systems uh, than anything we've seen during this. So it's, it's really put it in context, I think, and given us a chance to um, think ahead and plan instead of just react to a disaster. Yeah, I mean, that's fascinating to me because it has put it in context, but um, it really, I, I like what you said about uh, essentially what drives human behavior right um and uh it makes me think about the um the whaling movement um when there was a time not so long ago when um we would kill these huge beautiful animals because they were so useful you could use them uh to light lamps um they were tasty and you could make lipstick and <laughs> basically right and what um you know what was the cause of that that market decline it wasn't that we voluntarily decided that we weren't going to kill whales anymore not really it was that we discovered crude oil and that was a more effective way to um, lubricate things machines and to light things um so you know that's pretty telling um yeah. i have been uh sorry before you um go on i have to remember that i should ask our audience that if you have a question to submit to uh victoria kena please submit them to think tech facebook page and uh i think that if you google think tech facebook you will find it and then you can ask victoria some other questions and not just hear from me so victoria were you gonna um follow on yeah i was just going to um really talk about um, you know, how we could, uh, how, how this, this discussion with looking at the pandemic and, and thinking about it in, in uh, relation to um, the climate crisis, you know, something that we've thought about a lot and has been something coming from a lot of the um, kind of anti-mitigation movements in the climate world are saying, well, you know, we need to concentrate more on individual actions rather than these big systemic changes. So, um, you know, concentrate on things like, um, driving less and flying less, eating less meat, um, changing out your appliances, which are of course things that uh, we should do to help this, um, this economic transition take place. However, what this crisis I think has also really shown is that individual actions alone are not enough to fix the climate crisis. Um, so if we, look at, um, if we look at some of the, the impacts that we're seeing with decreases in, um, in carbon dioxide levels, uh, I think that since this has started, we've seen our decrease in emissions go down by about 5.5%. Uh, um, and so that's looking at, um, when I say emissions, I mean greenhouse gases. So mm -hmm. these are things that, um, the, the things in the atmosphere that are trapping heat. Um, so so we're, we've seen about a 5.5% 5, 5 decrease so far. 
which is a whopping change. It's yeah. bigger than anything we've seen in decades, um, even compared to like the last uh, uh, the last recession in 2008, um, it didn't come close. Um, but even that is nowhere near what we would need to get our um, get our global temperature down to limiting it to 1.5 or two degrees C above um, above uh, the, the average temperatures um, that we're trying to uh, uh, time, trying to keep the global temperature to. Right, and just can I just translate for our non-scientist viewers like myself, by C you mean Celsius? Yes, sorry. <laughs> yeah. And then in Fahrenheit, Celsius, is that, is it 1.8? It is, yeah, okay. but it's not like a direct conversion. So. Right, okay. And uh, and what we're talking about direct conversions, it's just, um, it's is that right to say that um, two degrees Celsius is sort of a guess? It's not, you know, like that's sort of an aspirational target. I mean, if we hit that, will we be safe? Will we have fixed the climate change crisis? Um, well, nobody really knows. And it's interesting you should bring that up in relation to, you know, kind of why we don't know and why we use models to talk about these things. Um, so something that uh, is another parallel between the climate um, world and the um, COVID pandemic is that we've seen a lot of models come into kind of public discourse. And we're talking about um, if we do these things, how will the temperature change in the future? Um, if we do these, uh, these um, mitigating things to control the spread of the virus, um, how will that change how we see it grow in, in cities and across the, the globe? Um, and these models are very uncertain. Um, and so as scientists, people who work with these models and create them, we're used to seeing those kinds of uncertainties and working within different scenarios of the future. Um, but I think a lot of times people are um, thrown when they see these projections and then they don't happen. But one of the other parallels between both um, climate, uh, climate models and the virus models are that the future is very dependent upon what we do. Um, right. So in the models, our actions are very responsible for what scenario plays out in the future. So if we see something happen that wasn't being predicted two weeks ago, maybe it's because we changed our behavior for the better and changed the future. Right. So to translate that into a sort of a Hawaii example, uh, we had um, some modeling coming out of, um, well, various universities in other countries as well. And, um, and then relevant to Hawaii, there was a prediction that on the 3rd of May, uh, we would be in a situation where we had a deficit of ICU beds by about 127. Mm -hmm. And um, the date today is, I'm going to say the 28th of April, 2020. <laughs> and that hasn't happened. Um, so uh, does that mean that we've sorted out coronavirus? And so can people keep going back onto the beaches like they want to? Uh, that's definitely not what it means. But I would say that um, the comparison of the projection with how we've done so far um, in controlling it in Hawaii is a testimony to the effectiveness of a lot of the policies um, and how well they've been instituted at, at local levels. Great. Thank you, Victoria. And we're just going to go to a quick break and then when we're back. We're going to hear more from Dr. Victoria Kina talking about uh, the coronavirus and the climate change connections. Aloha, I'm John David Ann, the host of History Lens on Think Tech Hawaii. History Lens deals with contemporary events and looks at them through a historical perspective or what we call a history lens. Uh, the show is streamed live on thinktechhawaii.com. Thanks so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. Mahalo and aloha. Hi, we're back with East West Center Insights. I'm Karina Lyons, and today I'm having a fascinating conversation with a hydroclimatologist, Dr. Victoria Kena. Welcome back, Victoria. Thanks. 
So uh, we were having fun geeking out before, and uh, I want to just get straight back into it. So um, talking about the coronavirus and climate change, this um, I keep hearing this idea of a silver lining. Um, basically, people equating air pollution to carbon dioxide. And perhaps if we could look at uh, slide one, and then you can tell me, um, should I be relaxing about getting on that plane as soon as I'm allowed to? Yeah, sure. So something that um, we've been seeing a lot of, and if you follow like internet memes, you've seen, um, I'm sure some that are, you know, like we are the virus, the earth is healing. And then, you know, <laughs> pictures of, um, you know, buffaloes wandering the street of Buffalo, <laughs> of Buffalo, New York, which is <laughs> a joke. Um, but, um, but really it does bring up a question is, is this a silver lining for climate change and what we're seeing? Um, so this, this uh, figure that we have up is from IQ Air. And it's really showing that um, in some of the world's major cities, uh, so we're looking at particulate matter 2.5 levels, which is a very damaging um, type of air pollution um, that's come from a lot of types of industries. Uh, and we're seeing these huge decreases in major cities around the world compared to the same period in 2019. So um, if you look at Delhi, that's a decline of up to 60%, which is huge. Um, now this is, this is good for lungs and air pollution gen in general, um, but it's not really productive to think of the, the pandemic as a silver lining for climate change in any way. Um, and particulate matter and air pollution are not the same thing um, as carbon dioxide emissions, right? So they're, they're two different things. And carbon dioxide emissions are actually largely driving global warming. Um, and particulate matter, ironically, um, can actually serve as, uh, as something to bounce the heat away in the atmosphere if you have those particles um, blocking, uh, blocking the, the uh, radiation from getting to the earth. Um, but uh, these changes are temporary and they're linked to a global disaster. Um, people are getting sick, dying, and they're grieving for a life that um, they and their children might never see again. So there's really no silver lining in this. Um, we've already talked as well about how these decreases, um, which has been about 5.5% 5, 5 .5 decrease in carbon dioxide in the past couple months, are not nearly what would be needed um, to show up in our record. Uh, so I think that it's uh, Carbon Brief and Scripps have done studies that have showed we need to be reducing our emissions by about 10% per year mm -hmm. um, to get to a level where we're going to see that in our atmosphere and in the global temperature. Um, and I might just note now that we're not seeing changes in temperature currently because our actions 10 years ago uh, from polluting are still being seen in our atmosphere today. Um, so there's that time lag um, of, of what we do in terms of actions and when we see the rewards. Yeah, that makes so much sense. But it's, I think it's the thing that's frequently forgotten, that the time lag is real. And so then that's, mm -hmm. that kind of goes back to that planning point that you said earlier, we have to plan for the future and then um, we'll see the results. Uh, and while you're talking about particulates, it made me think about um, all of my time in, um, in China <laughs> and made me want to cough. So uh, I wanted to ask, is there a direct link between climate change and, um, and human health and, and pandemics in general? Yeah, so um, if we could put up the second slide on the screen, it's actually a, um, a figure from the World Health Organization, which you've seen a lot in the news lately. Um, this is from a report that they did in 2015, which looked specifically at human health and climate change in Pacific Island countries. Um, and so this is from our, our regional WHO office. Um, the head of our regional office actually named climate change as one of the top three threats to Pacific Island health in 2019. I'm sure in 2020, there would be one more um, three, top three threats to Pacific Island health with uh, the COVID crisis. Um, but we, we often do see a relationship between things like drought, uh, extreme rainfall and other events associated with the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which you might have heard of um, in the region with the spread of things like vector-borne disease in the islands. Um, things that, uh, so vectors meaning mosquitoes, spreading things like dengue, um, chikungunya, things like that. Um, but what we also talk about is that climate change is really a threat multiplier um, in the spread of the disease and in um, uh, disasters everywhere. So a lot of time climate is not the reason why things are happening, but it is making it much, much worse. So that multiplier can cause um, illness in tens of thousands of additional people where there, uh, where there wouldn't have been. Um, the other direct link between climate change and pandemics is that direct connection between the pressure 
that humans um, put encroaching on wild habitats. So doing things like urban development, um, agriculture, and reducing the habitat for uh, additional biodiversity. Um, so about 75% of new and infectious diseases each year are zoonotic, uh, which means that they come from animals. And a lot of times it's those animals being in close proximity to humans. Um, so really something that we should be looking at going forward is how can we create a more holistic way of living that integrates considerations of ecosystem services and conservation of land um, and increased biodiversity and putting climate resilience into planning for our future? How can we integrate that with human health and um, global security, uh, of which human health is a big part? Um, we know that the planet support system is declining faster than ever. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, and the Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystems have uh, services have shown that um, the, they're declining faster than ever. Um, and increased biodiversity has been shown to inhibit the spread and introduction of pathogens in a lot of ways. So we need to better understand how climate change and environmental stress affect those patterns um, of disease, both hosts and vectors like mosquitoes and other animals. Um, and things like improving biosecurity and health protocols within the Pacific region and across the world can help with that. Mm. Um, gosh, that's interesting. That's and interesting. <laughs> no, and there, there's a lot there. And uh, um, it's funny, my immediate thought was, do you, you know, when you're thinking of humans and animals coming together, I, I did initially think of Tiger King, but when I got past that, <laughs> um, I was thinking about, um, one of my uh, assignments, um, I used to be a New Zealand diplomat, as, as you know, and I was sent to um, Colombo and Sri Lanka to negotiate for elephants um, because of the Convention on, um, Against Tr Trade and Endangered Species. Uh, elephants have to be gifted. And the reason that a country like Sri Lanka would want to gift elephants when they love them is because there's a real um, crossover between the habitat where humans live and where elephants live. And um, it might seem pretty foreign to us here in um, beautiful sunny Hawaii, but um, all throughout Sri Lanka, it's just really common because um, humans and elephants have lived together for hundreds of years there. Uh, and so, yes, for those of you, and of course of the DMZ, um, uh, and between uh, that area, between um, the demilitarized zone between North Korea and South Korea, mm -hmm. where there has been said to be um, increased biodiversity and specifically, um, I haven't, I haven't actually, not, I don't know if this has been verified, but um, more sightings of white tigers. Um, mm. And so I digress because I, <laughs> <laughs> and tiger, did you see that the tiger in the Bronx Zoo actually got um, COVID-19? It was I like didn't coughing. See that. So these, these zoonotic d diseases are still, are still spreading and changing, but yeah. Um, yeah. So, so uh, sorry, you go. No, I was just I was just going to go into to more issues about kind of like resilience of, of um, those peri-urban spaces. And as you know, the ESO Center also does research on, um, you know, kind of models of disease in these transitional areas between cities and forests and wild areas and um, looks at their uh, uh, looks at their their capability of, of spreading disease and um, harboring. Um, yeah. Hey, so. Um... I'm going to go from tigers to you. Uh, I was fascinated when I read your bio. So at the beginning, I described you as a hydroclimatologist, um, but you also have an engineering degree. Um, and so um, why? Why did you become a, a scientist as opposed to an engineer? Um, well, I would say I'm still, I mean, my PhD is in engineering. I'm, I'm, I, I may not do functional, um, you know, digging in the dirt, putting pipes in or designing, um, you know, wetland systems that filter um, polluted water type of engineering. Um, but really what I was always interested in was that practical application of scientific knowledge. So doing the research and finding a way to make it um, applicable on the ground now, which for climate change is um, becoming more and more important. Um, so the, the research that we do in my research group, the Pacific Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessment, or Pacific RESA program, um, is a NOAA-funded uh, research group that is interdisciplinary and it supports communities in Hawaii and the Pacific in adapting to the impacts of climate variability and change. 
Um, so with social and physical scientists working together, um, as well as working with legal and policy scholars um, and policy makers and natural resource managers, we really wanna pr produce climate research that is actionable at local and regional scales. Um, and by working with the East West Center, we've been um, you know, very lucky to be allowed to work with all sorts of um, managers and governments at different scales throughout the region to really translate this information mm -hmm. into useful uh, management and policy. Yeah, thanks, Victoria. I mean, as a as a former policymaker myself, um, I'm just really proud of your work because I just know how applicable it really is. And uh, as a daughter of the Pacific, I'm grateful to you and your team for all the work that you do to support the communities in the Pacific, and particularly here in the North Pacific. And we've only got a couple of minutes to go, so um, I just wanted to ask the question I've always wanted to ask you: is what, why climate change? Like, why do you care? <laughs> Um, I actually, it's, it's interesting. I, um, I don't think we talked about this before, but um, I used to actually be a biomedical engineer. Um, so I worked with genetics and um, mutations and uh, things like that, but I changed because of the, I wanted something that dealt with the environment um, in which I was able to make a, um, make a difference now with what I saw as coming as, you know, this huge climate crisis. Um, and I also didn't want an experimental organism um, that was going to feel pain. So I was using mice before in my research, and I just had enough of that. And so now I use water and the planet <laughs> and enough. look at data from that. Um, and right. I, can, I can do good and um, help get the science into um, informing policies, which we see now as, you know, more, more important than ever to create these relationships with policymakers where you're a trusted source of scientific information and data. Victoria, um, I'm sorry, I have to cut you off because we're about to go to the next oh, show. Okay. So, thanks, everybody. This has been East West Center Insights, and we're going to get Victoria on again, and we're going to listen to her and learn from her again. But thanks for joining us, and we'll be here in two weeks' time, Tuesday, 2 o'clock, where East West Center Insights. I'm Karina Lyons. Aloha. Aloha.